secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts of, with thy Holy Spirit that we might perfectly love thee and magnify thy holy name. In Christ's name we pray. As we say, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are our strength and you are our blessed redeemer. Let us now pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. When they asked him, Master, teach us how to pray. And they prayed, Our Father. church said amen together. Amen. Let us praise the Lord as we have our seats in the presence of the Lord.
John on the island of Patmos saw a divine vision, a vision of angels covering their face, two wings to cover their feet, two wings to fly. He asked the question, who are these? And the answer came that they have come out of great tribulation. And all they did all day long is praise God by lifting up holy hands and saying amen and amen and amen, giving total praise unto our Lord. And we give praise this day for our God, total praise. Magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's name together. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. And let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. For this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I greet you in the wonderful and magnificent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For we are because Jesus is because Jesus is, therefore we are. We give God praise on this day. You may be seated in the presence of the Most High God. We give God praise on this day, and I just want to say a happy anniversary, Trinity United Church of Christ. On 62 years of ministry and walking with God, we give God thanks on this wonderful and magnificent day as we celebrate 62 years of ministry. Uh, during our communion moment, uh, most of them come at the 7.30, I believe all of them came at the 7.30, but nonetheless, if we have any of our charter members who are with us, they will be served communion first. Uh, they will be sitting in front of the altar, and we want to say thank you to those who founded this church our charter members, those who are still with us, we give God praise. We thank God for Mother Sherry Bell Bird, uh, for Elder James Montgomery, Deacon Edith Hanna, uh, Brother Shelby Grant, 
Uh, Mother Audrey Overton, uh, Mother Marjorie Morrison, Mother Glendine Gilmore, Reverend Regina Reed, and Mother Joanne Gillespie, we give God thanks. Come on, let us thank God for our charter members. Now, don't, don't you all sit down yet, because uh, I have to let you know uh, that somebody has a, a birthday. We've got a couple of people. Got a, that piece of paper right over there? No, yeah, there we go. Thank you very much. We've got a couple of people. I just want to shout out in the choir, uh, none other. She's turning uh, 85 years young, uh, Sister Pitts, uh, Shirley Pitts. We give a happy birthday to you. Amen. And I've got to say this, turning 99 uh, later this month, none other than Deacon Hannah, we praise God for you. Turning 99 years, oh, come on now, turning 99 years young. One of our charter Members, You may be seated in the presence of the Most High God. Uh, we want to welcome everyone here to Trinity United Church of Christ, and we praise God that you are here worshiping with us on this day. Uh, if you are a guest with us today, this is your first time worshiping here at Trinity, uh, we would ask that you would just stand for a few moments uh, that we may give you a proper Trinity welcome. This is your first time. We praise God for you. We are honored by your presence. We thank God that you are worshiping with us. The applause you hear is our way of saying welcome and thank you for worshiping with us. We want you to take your time leaving, but in God's name, please hurry back. Praise God. And for those who are online with us today, uh, Brenda Tillman in Baltimore, Brenda Wilson Sampson, from Hawaii, Commander, uh, uh, Sergeant, I'm sorry, Command, Sergeant, Com no, Commander, Sergeant, Major, or is it Major, Command, y'all do it different every week, the man in charge in Kuwait, amen, <laughs> Commander, Sergeant, Major, Saunders, amen, Habiba from New Jersey, we have Lansing, Michigan with us, B from Lansing, Michigan, Bravo Alpha from uh, from Phoenix, from Phoenix, uh, it says from the Midwest here, Sharon Webb Abrams from Birmingham, Alabama, and also uh, we are grateful for Sister Natalie who is in the house, also online. And so we're going to do something that we have never done before. Uh, this will be the first time, and I'm going to ask the media team to assist me at this moment, and we want to bring in our digital campus from Phoenix, Arizona at this time. And so we're going to ask that they would bring in those uh, who worship uh, with us from Phoenix. And if we can bring them in. And there we go. Amen. Amen. We are delighted that you all are worshiping with us uh, from Phoenix today. And we are so grateful, Reverend Murphy and Sister Natalie. We're Delighted that you are worshiping with us, and we praise God uh, for both of you. And we know that the last meeting that we had, there were about a wonderful, about 10 or 12 people who worship uh, online from Phoenix, and we are just grateful uh, to you and the work that you're doing. Amen. 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 Thank you. We are delighted. Praise God. Amen. And we also want to take a moment. We have some guests with us here at Trinity, a guest of Dr. Linda Thomas. I'm going to ask that Vance Black Fox would stand at this time. Uh, and Dr. Thomas, we are delighted that you are worshiping with us. Vance Black Fox, we praise God for you. Thank you for worshiping with us. And we are honored that you are with us on this day. May God continue to hold you and your community. And we also want to take uh, this moment and say thank you to all those who are part of the UCAN program at Imani Village. We had a wonderful Christmas party for foster children 
who are part of the UCAN network, some children who are aging out of foster care, and we had a Santa who was there. We had toys and ministries purchase the toys for the children. They gave a list of what they wanted, and I want you to know that not only was the list fulfilled, but it was beyond their wildest dreams of the things that were provided. Some young people, they rode away on bikes yesterday. They just, they had a tremendous time. I want to thank Angie Powell, who is one of our members here at Trinity, who helped put this together, and we are so grateful, grateful to you. We also have another guest. He's really not a guest. He grew up here at Trinity. I saw him came in you know, when he came in. Uh, we have seen him since he was knee high to an ant, as they like to say uh, down south. Uh, but none other than Gregory Stewart, who is a Jeff Award nominated actor, who will be starring in uh, the Nat King Cole story. And we are grateful. And that is playing through January 7th. None other than Gregory Stewart. Nominated actor, grew up here at Trinity United Church of Christ. In the Nat King Cole story, you're going to hear a little bit of something from Gregory a little bit later, uh, but we are just delighted that you are here with us, Gregory, and uh, we are excited about what God is doing in your life. We also want to ask uh, that you would join with me as we celebrate uh, those who've come to be a part of this village here at Trinity on today. Uh, I, I'm going to call your name. I'm going to ask that you would stand uh, and uh, make some noise uh, for those uh, who are, are with us. I'm going to ask that Nortorsha uh, Campbell would stand. Is going to be a part of Food Share. Food Share, Sister Campbell. <laughs> Jania Cole. Jania Cole. Jania, Jania, we welcome you. Jania was baptized today. Amen. She's going to be singing in the choir. Virtually with us is Carolyn Flowers. Uh, Curtis, we praise God for you, Carolyn. Christian Derry, Christian Derry. He's going to be ushering. Amen. There we go, Christian. Amen. Lisa Everett. Where is Lisa? Lisa is going to be with our greeters. And I'm going to ask that Joe Bujama would stand. He's going to be with the 20-something ministry. Amen. Tina Griffin is going to be one of our greeters, greeting people when they will come to Trinity. Lee, Lee Hubbard will be a part of Interjani, our rites of passage. Amen. Gabrielle Jones will be one of our junior greeters. Nakia Milton will be a part of our yoga ministry. Talay Perry, Brother Perry, he's already singing in the men's chorus. He's going to be part of the men's chorus. Domia Shelton will be a part of Sisterhood. Arletha Smith will be a part of Greeters Ministry, a part of Greeters Ministry. Now I want you all to do this. I'm excited to, to mention, well, let me mention, Constance Young. Constance Young is going to be with Hurston Hughes Writers. Constance Young. Now. I have a father and son that I'm going to call, but they were baptized together. A father and son were baptized together today. I'm going to ask the father, Michael Smith, to stand and the son, Jalen Smith, to stand. A father and son baptized together. Amen. Oh, come on, give it up. What a beautiful thing. And we celebrate with you. Come on, give it up for all of those who just are a part of this family here at Trinity United Church of Christ. Now, at the end of service, we're going to ask that you who are on the main floor, if you would might exit out the middle, on the middle aisle here, and so that you might greet those who are new to our community, that you might greet them. And uh, hopefully we'll take a picture by the Christmas tree. I want to thank Keith Charles for doing such a beautiful job on the Trinity Christmas tree that is out there on today. Now, I want to let you know that we will have two offerings today. Uh, first offering, obviously our tithe and our tithe. Our second is our anniversary offering and 
to say thank you to our guest preacher, uh, Dr. F. Bruce Williams. He did a magnificent job at 730. You need to listen to the message when the church gets troubled. When the church gets troubled, it was magnificent. Amen. He did a beautiful job. But we want you to know that we have been talking, as we've been talking for the last several weeks, about uh, our anniversary offering, 62 cents, $6.20, cents, uh, $62, $620, $6,200, whatever it may be. Uh, but our children's church, they, our children said they wanted to participate. And children's church is coming in now. They are bringing their offering. They, some of them collected 62 cents. Some of them collected $6.00 and 20 cents. They are coming in and they're going to lay their offering on the table. And for those who, who have young people, our children's church is open. Amen. 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 Come on, y'all. Come on. Come on. Hey. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, come on. Come on. Oh, no, wait a minute. You, you, you don't forget. He kept going. Come on, give it up for Children's Church. Give it up for our Children's Church. You do not want to miss next week our Children's Church Christmas program after our 11 o'clock service next week. It will be absolutely joyous. You do not want to miss. I, have to, I just have to mention, uh, mention this. Uh, we did the thank you board for our children, our children, they were, they were thankful for a variety of things. One young person said he was thankful uh, for chicken and hot sauce, and uh, <laughs> that's what he said he was thankful for. The teacher said, is that what you're thankful for? I said, yeah, I'm thankful. I said, a true Chicago child, without a doubt. Somebody else was thankful for mild sauce. I was like, that's a real Chicago child. But I want to tell you what one of the young people said, and it made just a complete amazing impression on our young people as they were going around one young man simply said this I am thankful he's 10 years old that my mother beat cancer come on come on give God praise out of the mouth of our children I am thankful that my mother beat cancer and so for those of you who have children, that our children's church is training and teaching and educating our young people in the ways in which they should go. So that when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, those are all the announcements that I have, but I think you're going to be excited. Uh, we have some, uh, our media team has prepared some things today for us that I think will bless you on today. Amen. For 62 years, we, the Village of Trinity United Church of Christ, have been serving Jesus Christ, our liberating Savior, who has called us to be unapologetic of our relationship with God and unashamed of our culture as we prophetically stand with those who have their backs against the wall. Today, your gifts of tithes and offerings will allow our powerful ministry to continue to make an impact now and for future generations as we strive to provide for those who are hungry and homeless, support those in prison, and develop our young people to serve Christ and more. There are multiple ways for you to support the ministry of Trinity with your tithes and offerings. You may give through our Secure Give application. Text to give by dialing 855-781-8384 or use our cash app, dollar sign, Trinity UCC. You can also use our website, www.trendychicago.org, and with a few easy clicks, you can support this ministry. Also, our First Fruits Direct Drive program allows you to make your church a priority. And if you prefer to mail your gifts, simply send your tithe or donation to 400 West 95th Street. 
thank you for your radical generosity in support of Trinity United Church of Christ, the greatest church this side of the Jordan. I am Jada McIntosh, and you're watching Trinity News Live. Here at Trinity, we develop and curate lively ministries to further serve and work for our Lord and Savior. Take these next few minutes to listen in on the upcoming events within the Trinity community. Here at Trinity, we believe that your body is a temple and your health is well. Every year on December 1st, the world unites to commemorate World AIDS Day. This year's theme, World AIDS Day 35, Remember and Commit, reminds us, one, of global struggle to end HIV-related stigma, two, to honor those we have lost, three, to increase awareness and end discriminatory practices. Black communities are disproportionately affected by HIV criminalization laws, disparities in access to pre-exposure prophylaxis, PrEP, limited access to substance abuse and mental health services. This leads to Black communities experiencing overall worse health outcomes. This World AIDS Weekend, let's continue working toward a day when HIV is no longer a public health threat. Let's commit to dismantling racist systems in order to achieve equitable health care for all. For more info on HIV AIDS, treatment, care, and prevention, contact Trinity United Church of Christ HIV AIDS Ministry. This is Logan Page reporting the Trinity Health and Wellness segment. Remember, your health is well. Trinity United Church of Christ is always in the heart of the community, ever seeking to win the community's heart. Today makes 62 years that our prophetic and powerful village, Trinity United Church of Christ, has been engaging the community. I want to invite you to join me in pledge to give 62 cents, $6.20, cents, $62. $620 or $6,200 above your tithes and offerings today. Why? Because we are doing this in honor of our liberating and Christ-centered ministry that has been impacting the community for 62 years and will continue to bless generations to come. Our Trinity family, we're gonna go ahead and get a little spicy. Let's have some fun. So I want you to go ahead and turn to your neighbor. Yes, turn to them, give them a wink or a wave. And I want you to say, neighbor, hey, neighbor, we need more children and you church teachers today. So if you are interested in serving as teachers or administrators, please contact Ministry Services for more information. Hit it, DJ. So on Sunday, December 10th, between both services, there will be a women's retreat pop-up Christmas bazaar. So if you are into fashion and flair, then honey, go ahead and meet us back there. And so at 2 p.m., go ahead, come on, we finna pull up in this sanctuary where we are going to have our youth and children Christmas program. Honey, they about to be lit for Jesus Christ and the Lord, so go ahead and come through. Oh, what's that I see? I'm so excited to share with you our Trinity family, the first ever Trinity United Church of Christ billboard, which is in our beautiful community, located slightly west of our church. This billboard was installed to tell the story of what God is doing with our church in this community and to reflect the beauty of our village. So when you go ahead and drive by, make sure you honk your horn to celebrate being in the heart of the community. Hey Trinity family, I am currently here in Montgomery Hall and I am standing in front of this full interactive monitor. Now this is a touch screen and it is able to display images and videos while also illustrating visual elements. Now, this allows all of us to come together, whether we want to use platforms like Skype or Zoom or other things. So after worship service, go ahead, come back here to Montgomery Hall so that you can learn about how, with your help, we can install so many interactive monitors in all rooms throughout the church. See you there. 
This is Marlisa Stalling reporting our community engagement segment. And remember that you are the hands and feet of Christ. Trinity family, don't forget to mark your calendars for the following. December 9th, we will have our Imani service of remembrance at 1 p.m. On December 16th, our music department will host a Christmas concert at 1.30 p.m. And lastly, on Christmas Eve, Sunday, December 24th, 2023, we will have one in-person service at 9.30 a.m. and one online service at 6 p.m. Then join us on Christmas Day for one in-person service at 7.30 a.m. I am Jada McIntosh, and this is your Trinity News for December 3rd. Stay tuned for upcoming events and stories involving the Trinity community. Remember to stay blessed and live out loud for Christ. Thank you for watching.
I am excited to be able to present and introduce to you our preacher for our anniversary. He is an absolutely gifted man of God, Dr. F. Bruce Williams, who is the pastor of the Bates Memorial Church in Louisville, 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 uh, Kentucky. Uh, he is a tremendous leader. Uh, as he has been doing work not only in, in Louisville, but across uh, this nation. Uh, he is called on not only to consult and to preach, uh, but in uh, that city when uh, the, the horror went down in reference to uh, the killing of Breonna Taylor. It was Dr. F. Bruce Williams who was on the front line. Uh, and we thank God for his ministry. He did his demand studying with our pastor emeritus, uh, none other than Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright, Jr., and he is currently working on his Ph.D. under Dr. Frank Thomas at the Christian Theological Seminary, where his dissertation you know, will be on the great Reverend Dr. Frederick G. Sampson of Detroit, Michigan. And he will be taking his comprehensives very soon, and he will be what is called all uh, ABD, all but dissertation. And uh, we are looking forward to calling him Dr. Doctor, Dr. Dr. Bruce, uh, F. Bruce Williams. At 7.30, he just blessed us and tore up this church when the church gets troubled. Won't you join with me and welcome our preacher for the hour, none other uh, than Pastor Dr. Reverend F. Bruce Williams. <laughs> You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The psalmist said, my foot almost slipped, but then I got to the sanctuary. I believe church is still the best place in town. With all of our flaws, faults, and failures, ain't a better place than the church in general. And I'm just a little biased black church in particular. So I'm glad to be here this morning. I'm glad to be at Trinity. I'm glad to be in the presence of God in the house of God with the people of God. And uh, I'm grateful to be here. I uh, I'm really grateful for your pastor inviting me to come back, uh, and I think it's probably been a while since I've been here, uh, but it just feels like home. It just feels like home. Whenever I come, it just feels like home, and y'all make me feel like I'm at home. <clears throat> Amen. So I appreciate it, and uh, my members, some of them didn't know I was going to be here, but I'm sure they know by now that I am here. <laughs> I preached for our Saturday service, and then I caught a plane and came here, uh, and uh, so uh, one of my associates, who's a powerful preacher, is preaching today, and I don't know, I bet you, I'm sure some of them are watching, so just in case they're watching, what's up, y'all? Um, <laughs> amen, but thank you so much for holding out the red carpet of hospitality, uh, for being here. Um, 
Do me a favor. Would you give God praise for your pastor and my friend, Dr. Otis Moss the third OM 3Z. And while you're doing that, give God praise for Lady Moss as well, Monica, Miss Monica, and the whole first family. Y'all give it up for them. Amen. 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 And I love them. You're, of course, you know that your pastor is known all over the globe. And uh, <clears throat> they did such a good job of introducing me, especially this morning at 730. I'm thinking about putting them on payroll and just kind of sending them around the world. <laughs> sending them around the world. I got a chance to talk with uh, Sister Moss in the office, and she let me know that she was in seminary now. And uh, yeah, I'm just... I ain't trying to start nothing. I just said she's in summer. She told me, I'm going to tell you what she said. She can get me afterwards if she can catch me. But uh, she said, I'm, I'm just, I'm not in the MDiv program. I'm in the other master's program. I said, okay. In my mind, I was saying, you're in, not in the MDiv. You're, you're in denial is what you're in. <laughs> so I looked at her. I didn't tell her that part. I just looked at her and said, quit playing. Just quit playing. Um, but I'm excited to be here and excited to see them. And I haven't seen Monica in a while, so it's just good to see her as well. I see he and your son on social media uh, involved in fraternity. What, what fraternity is it? Uh, and, I'm, and I didn't say that because I'm in some other fraternity. I'm in Jesus by Jesus. That's the one I'm in. <laughs> That's before all y'all. That's Alpha and Omega and everything in between. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But I am so grateful to be here. And uh, uh, the next time I come, if I come again, I'm going to try to bring my wife uh, with me. My wife uh, just several months ago got a new kidney. And uh, she got a kidney transplant. Amen. And so I'm grateful. And she's doing very well now. And so she's still not traveling. But she, we will be. And she hadn't even come back to the church yet, but she is going to. And so if you if, don't, don't ask me to come again, because I ain't coming by myself if I come again. I'm make sure I bring my wife with me. So I'm just eternally grateful. God is still Jehovah Rapha. He's still a healer. Amen. And so I'm grateful to God for everything that God has brought us through. Amen. Amen. Her name is Michelle. Y'all ask her with a name. So y'all going to pray for her? Y'all going to call her by name? Don't make me dance already. I didn't even preach yet. Y'all going to make me dance up in church. <laughs> make me act a fool up in here. I ain't even started preaching yet. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, her name is Leona Michelle Williams. Just in case there's some other Michelles out there. You get Leona Michelle. <laughs> call her by her name. Amen. Well, y'all ready for the word today? I'm ready to share it. Let's go to God in prayer in preparation for the word. Let us pray. Lord, we love you more than we can say, but we can't even brag about it because we only love you because you first loved us. Thank you for this crazy, radical, ridiculous, irrational, unconditional love. Thank you for your son, our savior, without whom we would not even know or have eternal life. Thank you for the gift of your spirit and your presence in this place. We know that you're everywhere, but we thank you for the manifestation of your everywhereness in this place. We feel your presence. Now, God, as we prepare for the preaching moment, we confess today that we can do nothing until you come. Bless your people. Make fallow the ground of the souls of your people that the seed of truth might find depth that a relationship might be established between some soul and the Savior. Then, Lord, help me, your preacher, breathe on my words and make them thine. Rescue me from me. Fill me and empty me at your will. Love me and do whatever you want with me. You can be reckless without my permission. Hide me behind Calvary's cross. Make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only the shadow of the cross can be seen beneath. Take your glory, but Master, please give us the blessings, we pray. 
We ask it all in the name of the pre-existent, incarnate, crucified, resurrected, ascended, and soon coming King's name we pray. All the people of God said together, amen. I dare you to give God a hand clap of praise. God is worthy to be praised. If you would turn on your Bible or tap in your Bible app to a very familiar passage of Scripture, some of you who are Bible readers not only know of this Scripture, but you probably have it committed to heart. And as familiar as the passage is, let's just see what the Spirit has to say to the church regarding this passage. Acts chapter 1. We were in Acts chapter 16 in our early service. I want to back up. I'm going to go to chapter 1 in Acts, and I just want to lift up and line out for our focus one verse, verse 8, Acts 1 and 8. I'll be coming from the King James Version, not because of any other reason except for I just like the way it reads. Whatever translation you have is, is all the word of God. Acts 1 and 8 here as you celebrate 62 years of ministry. If you found it, say amen. amen. It reads, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the earth. And you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Somebody say witnesses. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the utmost parts of the earth. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. With the help of the Holy Spirit in your prayers, I'm going to talk, teach, and preach from this simple theme. Somebody ought to testify. Somebody ought to testify. Help me preach this. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, somebody ought to testify. Mm, that was good. That was good. Amen. Amen. Look at your other neighbor in case they're sitting on the end, nobody to talk to. Look at him and tell him somebody ought to testify. If you believe it, go on and give God praise. If you believe somebody <laughs> ought to testify. And I would that you would flank me with your prayer. Somebody ought to testify. We got some worshipers coming in. We want to get them be seated and situated so that we won't miss this word somebody ought to testify amen somebody ought to testify the words of our text today flow from the pen of the physician Luke Bible readers know that Luke was often a companion with the Apostle Paul on missionary journeys Luke writes the book of Acts as a kind of sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Luke writes Luke and then writes Acts as a sequel. And if you read both, you'll discover and discern that when he writes these two, he writes them to someone called Theophilus. Theo meaning God, Philios meaning love or friends, or as God lover or friend of God. Some scholars believe that Theophilus was some high government official whom Luke is orienting into the faith. Others believe that perhaps he was just someone whom Luke was mentoring and he was providing this information for his spiritual growth. Other scholars believe that there was not really a person named Theophilus, but instead Theophilus is the personification of anyone who is a lover of God and a seeker after God someone who would find the information in both the gospel and the book of Acts precious to them. I happen to believe that you don't have to choose between the two. I believe that Luke could have been writing to someone whose name means lover of God, Theophilus, and at the same time, he could be writing for people like Theophilus who were lovers of God, who were seeking after God, because after all, it was the providential hand of God that has kept both the gospel and the book of Acts through each generation, and it has been a blessing to those who are seeking after God. But the Bible says that he writes, Luke does, to this person named Theophilus. 
Notice, if you will, that when he begins writing the book of Acts, in the very beginning of the book, in just one sentence, he almost sums up the whole gospel of Luke. He says, uh, perhaps you can recall, Theophilus, that I began to write to you about the things that Jesus began to do and to teach. And I think it's important to pause long enough to point out the fact that these two principles are worth pondering. That is, that Jesus' ministry was characterized by doing and teaching. And the reason why I'm leaning on that point so hard is I believe that if it was good enough for the ministry of Jesus, it ought to be good enough for the ministry of his church. The Bible says he went about doing and teaching. And that ought to be the two wings that gets any ministry off the ground. It ought to be a ministry of doing and and teaching. These two things, doing and teaching, are kind of like Siamese twins that dwell together. If you cut them apart, they'll both bleed to death. You need doing and teaching. Now, to be sure, the doing ought to be preceded by good teaching. Because when doing is preceded by good teaching, then there is not the danger of it doing damage to people because the teaching is not healthy. But not only should it be doing preceded by good teaching, it should be teaching that eventuates into good doing. Because after all, faith without works, come on, you said it, I didn't, is dead. And so any faith that is not informed, faith that does not uh, lead from teaching to doing is teaching that is vapid, it is, it is empty, it is vain, it is irrelevant. And so our teaching should not be simply so that we can impress people with how many scriptures we have memorized. But teaching is not just for your head. It's supposed to get in your hands and your feet so, so it could lead to some doing. And so when Luke writes Acts, he characterizes the ministry of Jesus as a ministry of doing and teaching. And then he moves in the book of Acts from uh, witnessing to the fact that Jesus had a ministry of doing and teaching to the fact that Jesus had been raised from the dead. He was saying that Jesus is alive. He, he was saying that he got crucified, but he rose from the dead and appeared to many over a 40-day period, which is his way of saying that Jesus appeared to others so that he could validate the authenticity of his resurrection. And it's important, my brothers and sisters, that Luke writes that Jesus was raised from the dead because the resurrected Christ is central to the gospel message. I said the resurrected Christ is central to what it means to be a Christian. Paul said, if Christ be not raised, we are men and women most miserable. So Christ's resurrection is not something that uh, is arbitrary. It is, it is not something that we can take or leave, but it is central to it. And I don't know how you feel about it, but every time I hear that Jesus is alive, it makes me want to run around the parking lot because there's something powerful about the fact that he's alive. Because if you read the record, you remember they took him and they lynched him out on dead man's heel. And then they tucked him in a borrowed tomb but early Sunday morning was the day that death died he took the sting out of death robbed the victory from the grave snatched the crown from Satan's head pulled the keys of death and hell from Satan's waist and said I am he who was dead but I'm alive forevermore is there anybody else in the building who's glad that he's alive he's loose and he's available. That's why, my brothers and sisters, we sing songs about the resurrected Christ. It's why we sing, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds the future. Life is worth the living. Death is worth the dying. People are worth the loving just because he lives. Can I just say it one more time for the Holy Ghost? Jesus is alive. I know he's alive because I spoke to him this morning before I came to preach to you. Look at your neighbor and tell him he's alive. He's alive. 
he's alive. And so he writes about the resurrection of Christ. And then he moves from writing about the resurrection of Christ to rhetorically remind us not only of what Jesus did, but what we ought to be doing in light of what Jesus did. In other words, if we are actually faithful followers of the sable skin sandals wearing carpenter from Galilee, then it means that because he has touched and transformed your life, he has now laid claim to your life, and now he expects something from you. Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking about me. He's talking about me. Yeah. Want to see if you was awake. He's talking about me. He, he's expecting something from us. And what's so interesting is, uh, as he moves through it, he begins to talk about how Jesus sits with his disciples. And the disciples ask him this question in verse 6. They ask him, will you now restore Israel? Now, that's important, my brothers and sisters, because it is this query from the disciples that gives you insight into the fact that at this point they still have a very narrow and parochial understanding of the redemption plan. They think that Jesus is up just so he can restore Israel. And he's trying to get them to see that what I did is bigger than what you want. Now, I don't blame them. I get why they think that Jesus was to restore Israel because they had been oppressed by so many nations. But Jesus had to help them understand that as a consequence of them being oppressed, their understanding made them think so narrowly that they thought, watch, that they were not just chosen, here it is, but they thought that the fact they were chosen made them better. But I stopped by on my way to heaven to let you know that just because you're chosen don't mean you're better. And that's important for every twice-born, blood-bought child of God to recognize. You need to put your chest back in. Quit breaking your arm to pat yourself on the back because you have been saved by God. You are not better than others because you are conscious of the grace of God. You might be better off than others because you know that you are a recipient of God's grace, but you are not better than others. And, and, and it was important for Jesus to make them recognize that because he wanted them to see that being chosen was not because God was impressed with Israel. God didn't choose them because he saw them and said, what a mighty nation they are. I'm going to engage in a covenant relationship with them. No, God didn't choose them because of them as much as he chose them in spite of them. When they were a ragtag band of insignificant nobodies, God said, Let me watch this. And God chose them, but God did not choose them to lift them over other nations. God chose them so that they could be exhibit A to see what happens when you hook up to the holy and connect to the creator. God did it so that the relationship could have gravitational pull on other nations so that they too would want to know the God that they know. And that's the reason why you've been saved. It's not so you can look down your nose of snobbery and judge other people with microscopic criticism. God wants to use you as exhibit A because when you are out there doing everything you thought you were big enough to do and didn't even have God on your mind, God had you on God. God's mind and by his grace he saved you somebody shout grace you do know what grace is God God didn't save you because he saw how wonderful you were and how holy you were living God saved you in spite of you grace is unmerited favor grace is extraordinary goodness grace is extravagant benevolence grace is overshadowing mercy no wonder the songwriter said amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found blind but now I see here's my part through many dangers toils and snares I have already come it wasn't my degree it wasn't trustees it wasn't deacons it wasn't even the church it was grace hallelujah that brought me safe this far and guess what it will be grace 
that will lead me on. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God for his grace. <laughs> and so Jesus said, when they ask, now will you restore Israel? When is God going to do it? That's what they were asking. Here's Jesus' response. Jesus responds by saying in substance, that ain't none of your business. It is up to God to decide how, who, when, and where he sets the times or the seasons for anything. Your job is not to be preoccupied with what God ought to be doing. Because if there's one thing for certain, God is always on God's job. The question is, are you on your job? If there's ever a problem, it's never in heaven, it's always on earth. It's never divinity, it's always dust. It's never God, it's always us. Jesus said, you stop worrying about what God is supposed to do and remember what you are supposed to do and you shall receive power <laughs> after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in concentric circles of evangelistic fervor in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the utmost parts of the earth. Now here's shouting material at least for me because what Jesus is saying in substance to them, God has a redemption plan that he wants to initiate, has initiated in the world through his son. He has initiated so that all will know. And the plan that God has chosen to get everybody to know it is he's chosen you to tell it. And he's only got one plan. Plan A. Ain't no plan B. Y'all not getting it. Y'all ain't feeling like I want you to feel it. What I'm trying to tell you is God has chosen to use the likes of you and me to get the word out about his love. Ooh, y'all y'all still ain't feeling me like I want you to feel me. Does it does it amaze anybody that God has decided to depend on the likes of you and me to get the word out? You still ain't feeling me like I want you to feel me. Here's what shouts me. See, we need to understand that God uses us, but he don't need us. I felt that when I said it. See, uh, God is so good at being God that God could choose another method to get the word out. Somebody said poetically what I'm trying to say sermonically. They said if God wanted to, he could have taken the pen of time and dipped it in the ink of eternity and wrote the gospel against the backdrop of the blue ether so that when men and women looked up, they would see the gospel written across the skies if he wanted to. He could have written the gospel on the vocal cords of every bird so that when they sang their song in the morning, the gospel would fall on the ears of every waking man and woman if he wanted to. He could have written the gospel on the leaves of every tree so that when the wind blew, it would take the gospel to the four corners of the known world. And yet God chose to use the likes of you and me, fickle and finite and phony and sometimey. Somebody ought to give him 10 seconds of praise because God has chosen to use somebody like you and me. Look at your neighbor and say, he chose me. He chose, he chose me. That ought to make you do a holy dance. You, if you really are honest about what you are like, you ought to be jumping in the aisle right now and doing the holy. God chose me. Okay, y'all acting real holy. I'm having flashbacks about my own life, and I still don't understand why God chose me. You can be holy if you want to, but I'm so glad. That he looked high beyond my faults and saw my need. He decided to depend on me. And you shall receive power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ain't that good news? Uh, he, so Jesus is rhetorically reminding them of what the mission is. Jesus says God wants to use you to get the word out about his loving and liberating power. 
a God who liberates from personal sin and liberates from sinful systems. He's a wonderful God. And so he's saying God wants to use you to use that central ministry. Now, that's not the only thing that the church ought to be about. It's central to what the church ought to be about, but that's not the only thing the church ought to be about. The church, there's some other stuff the church ought to be about, and since this is your 62nd anniversary, you don't mind if me just take a minute and remind you of some of the stuff that the church ought to be being about. First of all, church ought to be about worship. Let the church say worship. Yeah, the church ought to be about worship, and you know you ought to worship God because he's worthy. God is worthy to be praised, and unless you don't get it yet, even if you don't worship him, he's still worthy of the worship and the praise. And God doesn't call us to worship God because God is on some ego trip and needs you to stroke God's ego. Actually, when it comes down to it, you're the one who benefits from worship more than God does. God going to be God whether you worship God or not. But is there anybody in the building who knows that sometimes there's something cathartic about worshiping God? See, some of y'all got it twisted. You, you don't want to worship God because you don't feel like worshiping God. But worship ain't got nothing to do with your feelings. The Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. So if you need a reason to praise God, just inhale and exhale. And if you can breathe, I feel God in here, you got a reason to praise God. Am I right about it? So you sitting up in church talking about, well, I don't praise like that. I'm, I'm just different. You ain't different. You disobedient. <laughs> Every now and then, something ought to come out of your mouth. How, how in the world God been is so good to you and you come to church Sunday after Sunday and sit through the whole service with your arms folded and legs crossed. The devil is a liar. Look at your name and say, open your mouth. Yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all wasn't quiet at the club. You... Come on, you weren't quiet at the ball game. You, you mean to tell me you're going to get cute when you come to church? You ought to worship him. You wouldn't leave with a headache if you just going to let it out. You're so worried about what the people you roll with going to think if you cry, if you wave your hand. Am I right about it? God's been so good to you that you don't need to test the wind or take a poll of public opinion to see if it's all right for you to worship God. Am I telling the truth? I don't know about you, but God's been so good to me. If I happen to raise one of my hands and you side on me, I ain't putting my hand down. I'm putting my other hand up. That's how good God has been to me. You better go on and practice down here because if you don't like noise down here, you don't want to go to heaven because it's going to be hard. Y'all better leave me alone today. See, see, you don't even understand that praise is your weapon. See, when you're going through hell and you fuss, cuss, and complain, the devil knows what to do with you. But he don't know what to do with you when you're going through hell and you still say, I will bless the Lord at all times. God's praise shall continually be in my mouth. So the community ought to be a worshiping community. That's the one thing. Second thing you ought to be about is you ought to be about evangelism. And that's what I'm talking about. You ought to be about getting the word out. And, but, but the third thing you ought to be out is you ought to be about education. Let the church say education. <clears throat> Matthew 25 says, go teach, baptize, and then keep on teaching. That's the part some of us miss. We think we're finished once somebody gets saved and baptized. But he says, keep on teaching because the word Disciple means learner, and you're a lifelong learner. Ain't nothing worse than a disciple who think they know everything. Can't tell them nothing. 
Help me, Holy Ghost. But we ought to all be about education. We ought to be about informing ourselves about the goodness and grandeur and grace of God. And so we ought to be about education. And we ought to be about fellowship. Let the church say fellowship. fellowship. Now I hear somebody's middle mechanisms clicking right now. You're saying, what is the benefit of fellowship? And that's because you don't understand what fellowship is. You think fellowship is when everybody gets up and hugs everybody. You think that is the sum total of fellowship. You think because you gathered together for a common cause. You think that is the sum total of what fellowship is. But the word fellowship means more than shared space. Fellowship means shared life. Which means when you come to church, you have to risk being vulnerable in the community. See, some of y'all just want to come and get your praise on and then go home without any connection to the community. But God never saved you to live like a saint solo. You can't become everything God wants you to become if you're not connected to the community. So you've got to risk being real in the community. Ain't nothing worse than when you ask the saint how they're doing and they're always too blessed to be stressed. You mean you'll never go through nothing? You ain't never depressed. You ain't never brokenhearted. You ain't never hurt. And so you come to church and got to pretend like you got it all together. Can I let you in on a secret? Nobody believes you. You ain't always got it together. You need to risk being honest with somebody. But can I flip it? Because if they're going to risk being honest and transparent, the community has got to be safe enough for them to be honest about what they're going through. Because you know how some people can be in the church. If you tell them what you're going through, what you're struggling with, if you tell them that you're honest, you can tell them at 4 o'clock, but by 6 o'clock it'll be on the news. You can't trust nobody with your stuff. I'm preaching better than you listening. You... Somebody say fellowship. You can't make it without, that's why the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, which is the custom of some, but encouraging of one another as the day approaches. You live in a world that is no friend of Jesus. Jesus said they hated me, you belong to me, so if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Am I right about it? So if you live in right, then you ought to get in trouble every now and then. And if you a saint of God and you've been a saint a while and you ain't never got in trouble, you ain't doing it right. Am I right about it? Somebody say fellowship. Not only do you exist for fellowship, but you also exist to engage in mercy ministry, which means that all your ministry is not inwardly focused. Some of it is outwardly focused. God is a God that has shown us mercy, and God wants to get mercy out of us, through us, to others who need mercy especially the most vulnerable people in our community the Bible wants us to show mercy Matthew 25 when I was hungry you you fed me when I was naked you clothed me when I was in the hospital you visited me when I was in prison you came to see about me when I was homeless you put a, a roof over my head when did we do that Lord when you did it to the least of these come on you've done it unto me and so you can't be the recipient of mercy and not a conduit through which mercy is to go which means it's not enough for us to declare the love of God we've got to demonstrate in tangible ways the love of God because some people are not convinced that God loves them just cuz you say so say so has to move to see so you can't just say it. Come on now. They've got to see it. Come on. That means then that when you leave here from having church, you're supposed to leave to be the church. Hallelujah ought to result in do you -luya. Look at your neighbor and tell him, do something, do something, do something. Yeah, you got to show some mercy. And then, and then, and, and another reason, the last reason you, you exist is you exist so that you could be advocates of justice in the world, of righteousness, which means rightly treating other people. 
was it Cornel West who said justice is what love looks like in public? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting that the two greatest commandments according to Jesus, watch, is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, somebody say and, God the tailor said, don't even take a breath there. And your neighbor as yourself on these two hang all the law and the prophet, which means that they are inextricably bound together. Your vertical relationship with God is crucially connected to your horizontal relationship to other people. That's why the Bible says, how can you say you love a God whom you've never seen? And you can't stand your brothers and sisters, come on, who you see every day. You're a liar and the truth is not in you. That's not me. That's Bible. Listen, sometimes you can tell the spiritual health of a person's relationship with God based on how they treat other people around them. So I don't see how you can read the same Bible I read and not conclude that God is interested in justice in the world because justice is about how we treat one another. And that's the only problem I have with some of my white conservative Christian friends because they think it's some subcategory you can take or leave. But justice is central to the gospel message. I meant it, I said it, I meant it, I'm here to represent it. And, and so I don't see how you can say you love God and I can't see it in the way you treat people who don't look like you. Preach, pastor. I'm gonna need some extra security to get out of here. So those are some of the things that we ought to be involved in. We ought to be about it after 62 years. That's what you've been about. But we cannot forget that God has tapped us on the shoulder and has called on us to declare to others the love of God through Jesus Christ. So watch what he says. And you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, do you see the sequence? <laughs> and you shall receive power and then be my witnesses. You see the sequence? Power, witnessing. Not witnessing, <laughs> power. He said power, witnessing. The only reason I'm leaning there so hard is that what I'm trying to argue is you can't do the Lord's work without the Lord's help. Y'all going to let me work this out? See, uh, one of the reasons why some ministries perhaps are impotent is because you're trying to do it in your own strength and steam. But the good news is you don't have to do it by yourself. You've got a God who's already committed to giving you power. God, I wish I could say this like I feel it. Can I testify for just a minute? One of the things that delivered me from the burden part of pastoring is this truth. Uh, early in my ministry for a long time, I was, I mean, the, the, the church sent me home in the fetal position so many times. But the reason is I was trying to do it all myself. I didn't realize that's what I was doing, but I did it, and I got to the end of myself, and I was saying to God, God, I just can't do it, no more. I just can't do it. God said, I've been waiting for you to get to that point where you can say it. <laughs> he said, because after all, it ain't your church, it's mine. You're not responsible for it. You can't make nobody do nothing. If I can't make them do it, you can't make them do it. He says, listen, I know you gifted because I gave you the gifts. I know you've been to school and you know a few things, but a step back and watch me do what I can do with my own church. Watch. And when I gave God's church back to God, that thing took off. Watch this. And I was able to do what God has called me to do because God gave me power to do it. And what I'm trying to tell you is if God called you to do it, you got power to do it. Because God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the call. God, God never gives assignment without enablement. 
God never gives you a mission without giving you the might to carry out the mission. So if God called you, quit wondering if you can do it. God gives you divine anointing to do what he's called you to do. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I feel like doing the holy dance now because that means that I'm not in it by myself. Anybody in here glad that you ain't in it alone? And I ain't talking about the person sitting around you. I'm talking about God. Look at your neighbor and say, God gets involved. Y'all don't hear me. God, God is not an absentee landlord. God has not wound the church up like a watch and flung it into the cosmos to take itself away in isolation. God gets involved in the affairs of God's church. If God, I like this, if God sends you on an assignment for God, God is completely committed to making sure you have everything you need to carry out what he called you to carry out. And God will search the four corners of the universe to make sure you have what you need. And if after having searched the four corners of the universe, God can't find what you need, he'll create it out of nothing. Y'all don't even know where to shout. That's how committed God is. Now, God is not committed to some stuff you decided to do, but he is committed to making sure everything he assigns comes to pass sooner or later. And you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you, somebody say you, you shall receive power. That you is plural and personal. Uh, uh, the fact that it's personal obviously is you. The fact that it's plural means, watch this, that the power is not reserved for some special category of super Christians. You ain't got to have bishop in front of your name to be anointed. Y'all not saying nothing in here. You, you ain't got to have chief apostle Reverend, doctor, pastor, deacon, nothing in front of your name. If you are a child of God, you are already plugged into the power. You just need to use what you come, oh God. <laughs> Ain't that good news? So you, somebody say you. Uh-uh, look at your neighbor and tell him you. You shall receive power. I got, I got to quit. I know y'all want to go eat chicken, but watch the text. He says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall receive power. You shall receive power. Now, the cousin verse to this is Matthew 28. Go ye therefore, teach all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you even to the end of the age. That's the cousin verse to this one. Same mission, stated a different way. But there's something you've got to see. I tried to explain it in a different sermon earlier today. <laughs> this shouts me every time because I know what I'm going to say. I feel like shouting. Because he said, you shall receive power. And if you look at Matthew 28, it gives you a nuance that you need to know. Because we start at go ye therefore. But that ain't where it starts. It starts at and all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go ye therefore. <laughs> Y'all are missing it. Uh, uh, power. There's some words for power. One is dunamis. And one is exousia. One is power, the other is authority. Power is the ability to do it. Authority is the right to exercise the power. So God hasn't just given you power. Y'all are too calm. God has given you the authority or the right to exercise the power. Y'all are so calm. Okay, okay, let me help you. Let me help you. In the same book, in the book of Acts, there's a story about the seven sons of Siva. Y'all remember that story? Seven sons of Ziba were watching the ministry of Paul, and they noticed that Paul was casting out demons with a 100% success rate. 
So they were wondering where he got all his power, and they noticed that every time he cast out demons, he would say, in the name of Jesus. So the seven sons of Siva decided they would get in on the racket as well. They wanted to make some coins on the side. So it said, it can't be that hard because we have already checked it out, and we noticed that he always had success when he uttered the words, in the name of Jesus. So that's what we're going to do too. And so they sent out flyers and went on Facebook, and they went on Instagram and went on, I, I, come on now, and they let everybody know, look, if you got any demon-possessed cousins or family members, bring them because we, go, we know how to cast them out. Paul ain't the only one we know. And so the Bible says they got their best robes. You got to read the text. They got their best robes. Watch. And the Bible says they stood over them, the demon-possessed, and they declared this, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out. And when they said that, the demons spoke back. Read the text. And they said, Jesus we know. Paul we know. But who are you? You trying to pimp the paraclete for personal gain. You trying to use Jesus' name to make a name for yourself. You trying to use power without authority, and authority is given by relationship. We don't know you, so you don't have access. And the reason why you ought to be tearing up the bench you sitting on is you the one to claim you are twice born and blood bought. And if you are, that means you have the authority to exercise the power. Power. So go home and use your authority. And when folk come in here, use your authority. And when the devil is on your track, tell him to get behind you. And the Bible says he must flee because you have authority. That's why you can tell folk who sin that they've been forgiven. Not because you forgave them. But you've been given the authority to pronounce over them that they have been forgiven. And, God, I feel God in here. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Come on, let me cut across the field. And the power is for a reason. You shall be my witnesses. Now, that's courtroom jargon. You should be my witnesses. Uh, now, you don't become witnesses in a courtroom just when you take the stand. You are witness before then because both the prosecuting and defense attorney have your name on a list. So you became a witness when you agreed to participate. So you don't become a witness when you take the stand. When you take the stand, that doesn't determine if you're a witness it just determines whether you're a good witness or a bad witness. Y'all not saying nothing in here. And I want you to notice, if you've ever seen, I like this, a courtroom set up, notice that Jesus says you will be my witnesses, not my judges. Because up front, aside from the jury on the side, there are only two seats. One is for a judge. It's one for... A witness. Some of y'all in the wrong seat. I ain't scared of y'all. God didn't call you to judge anybody. See, the only reason the judge is the judge is not only because the judge has the skill, but the judge is the only one with all the information. And the reason why you can't judge anybody else is because you don't have all the information. God didn't call you to be no judge. He calls you to be a witness. And a witness don't judge, a witness testifies. Here's the problem, Pastor, that I'm almost finished. We got too many witnesses taking the stand, pleading the fifth. Can I get in your business? And I know why you plead in the fifth. I know why you ain't saying anything because witnessing ain't just lip style, it's lifestyle. 
And some of y'all's lift style and lifestyle don't match. And so some people can't hear what you're saying because what you're doing is speaking too loud. You shall be <laughs> my witnesses. Look at your neighbor and tell them, take the stand. And when you take the stand, somebody ought to testify. <laughs> now, uh, where should you testify? The, uh, the parameters for testifying has already been set. You don't get to set them. He said, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, utmost parts of the earth. He says, uh, start in Jerusalem. That means your family. <laughs> Some of y'all flying over your family, <laughs> trying to witness to somebody else, and your, <laughs> and your evangelistic field is at your address. <laughs> and I get why you ain't talking to people in your family, because it's hard to talk to people who know about you. But don't let it, don't let it discourage you because they knew you win. Just keep walking out your faith. Because if you keep walking out your faith and it's real, after a while, they're going to see a difference. If Jesus has made a difference in your life, they're going to say, well, why don't you do drugs with us no more? Why don't you whoremonger with us no more? Why don't you do what we used to do? And you say, well, I did it before, but I'm not the same person as I used to be. Well, how did you change? I'm glad you asked. His name is Jesus. Look at your neighbor and say, start in Jerusalem. <laughs> Some of y'all need to go home and tell somebody in your house about Jesus. Why? Jerusalem, Judea. Judea are just your acquaintances. These are people that know you, people who work with you. And see, if you're living out your faith, then people wouldn't be surprised if they saw you in church now. <laughs> if some of y'all friends saw y'all in church, they would faint. <laughs> But you've got to tell, talk about Jesus and his liberating power to your acquaintances. Watch this now. This is going to get somebody. And then he says, Samaria. Now, remember, Jews and Samaritans had no dealings with one another. So he's saying you got to tell about the love of God to the people who can't stand you. Ooh, ain't nobody standing. Y'all were standing up a minute ago. I saw you. I'm almost finished, but you wouldn't stand. Why y'all ain't standing now? You know what that means? It means you don't get to decide who gets to hear about the love of God. Just because you don't like them don't mean God don't love them. Preach, Pastor. Has it ever occurred to you that the way God gets rid of your enemies is make them your friends? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to preach the best that I can. And then he said the utmost parts of the world. Those are people who don't even know you yet. I'm about finished, y'all. So you start in Jerusalem, go to Judea, go to Samaria, and go to the utmost parts of the earth. Wherever you are going, as you go, you need to tell somebody about the resurrected Savior, about the love of God, about the one who's alive, loose, and available. And I don't know why it's so difficult for you to tell, because he's been good to you. Has he been good to anybody? In the building? I mean, don't fool me now. Has he really been good to somebody in the building? If God has been good to you, then you ought to tell somebody about how good he's been. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor somebody ought to testify. Come on now. Your story may not be mine. My story may not be yours. Oh, but everybody got a story. If you don't tell your story, can I tell my story? Not only did he save me, not only did he anoint me, not only has he filled and forgiven me, not only is he using me, but every time I turn around, he keeps on blessing me. Shoes on my feet, clothes on my back, food on the table, joy in my heart, sanity in my mind. He's my money when I'm broke. He's my fire when I'm cold. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Do you know who I'm talking about? I don't know. 
how you feel about it. But the God I serve is still opening doors that no man can close. He's closing doors that no man can open. And when I'm in a cul-de-sac of human circumstances with no way of escape, my God is still making a way out of no way. He's still healing diseased bodies, diseased minds, uneased souls. Is there anybody in the building that doesn't mind giving him praise? Look at your neighbor and tell him stop pleading the fifth. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor somebody ought to testify. If you won't tell it, let me tell it. Let me sing it. Let me shout it. Let me dance it. He's, God, you better come get me. He's been so good to me. And if my past is any indication of what he's going to do in the future, I'm not just going to praise him for what he's done. I'm not just going to praise him for what he's doing, but I'm going to give him some anticipatory praise. I'm going to praise him for what he's going to do. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, blessed name, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Some of y'all uh, still look depressed. Well, I'm glad you came anyway. God sent me here uh, to tell every depressed person, uh, with your head down, uh, lift up your head. Oh, ye gates, uh, be ye lifted up, uh, ye everlasting doors, uh, and the King of glory uh, <laughs> shall come in. Uh, who is the King of glory? Uh, the Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle, lift up your hands, O ye gates, be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? Mary's baby, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star, do you know him? Have you tried him? Shout yeah! Yes! Hallelujah! Yeah. Yes, he is. Yes, 
my, my, my. Won't you just help me to say thank God for the preaching ministry of Dr. F. Bruce Williams. Lord have mercy. If you never preach again, brother, you preach enough preach today. My, 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 my. We thank God for this message. We thank God for this messenger. Amen. You have blessed Trinity today on our anniversary. And right now, the door of the church is open right at this moment. That God is looking for you to be a witness. To be a witness. God is looking for you to be a witness. The door is open right now for you to be a witness. To commit your life, to commit your heart, to commit your mind to be a witness today. To be a witness. God is waiting for you. Testimony. We welcome you right now. Be a testimony. The door is open to you. God is waiting for you. We welcome you right now. The door is open. The door is open. You have a testimony. God is waiting on you right now. We welcome you to be a part of the Ark of Safety. God is calling you, and we give God thanks for what God is doing, that you have a testimony. My, my, my. Can I get a witness in here? Can I get a witness where you blessed today? Can I get a witness? Were you blessed today? Amen. We want to take this moment and we want to welcome those who've come to be a part of this community. Now, now one has already been a part of this community for a while, coming for the, to get the right hand of fellowship. She had to finish her classes, get the right hand of fellowship. Sister Jackie, we praise God for you. We praise God for you. Amen. it is a blessing to meet you and we want you to know that your family has expanded today and all these folks around here they, you got new family members and we want to extend our hand right now to you and simply say welcome to the Trinity the greatest church this side of the Jordan amen give God praise for Dominique I'm gonna ask that you would follow Dr. Sue Ladd and our stewardship ministry Sister Jackie's got to get the, the right hand of fellowship. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds at this moment. As we are standing, I'm going to ask that we would go to God in prayer at this moment as we prepare for our holy meal known as communion. Lord God, we ask that you will anoint this meal this moment, this time, as we come to this holy table. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. I want to invite first that our deacons would assist us for our charter members as they come to be seated in front of the altar, as they will be served before anyone else. And we praise God for them, for there would be no Trinity United Church of Christ without them. Amen.
to the loser's power. And let us, at this moment, let us confess our sins together. As our confession comes up on the screen, we invite you and those who are online to join us as we confess our sins together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we come before you today to acknowledge and acknowledge our sins, our shortcomings, and our breaking of our covenant with you. Not only have we done the things we ought not to have done, said the things we ought not to have said, we have done, done so many things we ought to have done. It is silent in the midst of this nation. Not only are we guilty of that thing, our ears and pretended not to hear the cries for liberation that come from the very lives and the hearts of the oppressed, even our own black brothers and sisters. Say thus, O oh Lord, be known as the very Son, and keep us ever mindful of thy great The question is often asked, as Pastor Williams has already stated, uh, that people may raise the question, how am I saved? It is not through your memory of scripture, your attendance to church, but something known as grace. This is unmerited, unwarranted favor and love that flows from God. God didn't have to do it, but God made the choice to love us, not because of us, but because of the love that God has for us. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever, believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the basis of forgiveness, is through God's love, God's grace, and God's care. We have confessed our sins corporately, collectively, as a community. May we be seated at this moment that we confess our sins privately, that we do not come to this table carrying uh, the luggage, grudges, and hurts that often life places upon our shoulders. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, forgive us for thoughts that run through our mind. Forgive us for the words that we utter from our lips. Forgive us uh, for speaking out of turn when we should have kept our mouth shut. Forgive us for not speaking up when we were silent but should have spoken. Forgive us, O oh God, and bless this holy meal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
that night Jesus took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Likewise, the cup of wine after the meal. The wine symbolized the blood that was shed for remission and redemption of sin. Take and drink. Once again, Lord God, we give you thanks and we give you praise for this holy meal. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. We greet our charter members and prepare for our benediction share something very quick of my apologies for not sharing it early. We're going to have Brother Gregory Stewart is going to bless us at the end of service. Uh, but I want to share that there's going to be an email that will go out. It's saying to media, there's going to be an email that will go out. Uh, it will be first come, first serve. Uh, that we have been given a very small theater uh, by Sony Pictures. Uh, to screen a new film entitled The Book of Clarence. Uh, you will get an email. Don't, don't come to me. Don't come to Monica. Looking for it. There are no physical tickets. This is through Sony Pictures. I don't work for Sony. Don't, don't ask me. Don't try to show up at the theater. I'm talking about you from Trinity. Sony Pictures. All you have to do is watch the film and do a survey after the film, and there'll be a small talk back. But it's a small theater, limited space. Don't, don't ask me. Don't ask Monica. Don't ask nobody else how to. They're limit, you, it's first come, first serve through an email. There are no tickets back there. Don't go back there looking for no tickets. Don't ask no deacon for no tickets. Sony Pictures. Sony Pictures. Just want to make that clear. So for those of you who are signed up with our email system, uh, there will be an email that you will receive. You have to respond to it, and then they will send you the appropriate link so that you can attend the screening of the Book of Clarence. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us prepare 
for our benediction at this moment if we might stand together. King Cole, how you doing, man? <laughs> Looking sharp, Gregory. <laughs> Let us, with this prayer, may the peace of God be with you. May the peace of God be with you and with you. May the peace of God be with you. May no demonic force enter your household. May God place a hedge of protection around you and around yours. May God's peace be with you. May you be a witness in your home, around those who don't like you, and in the uttermost parts of the world. May the road, may it rise to meet you. May the wind always be at your back. May the sunlight of Jesus Christ always grace your cheek. And may rain, may it gently fall upon your field. And may God keep you in the hollow of God's hand. Until we meet again, be a witness. Amen. Brother Gregory, come on. Y'all don't leave this. You gotta, y'all gotta hear this brother right here. This man is a gift. Our church of uh, just got done doing a role at Black Ensemble Theater, where we did um, Reasons, a tribute to Earth, Wind, and Fire, and I portrayed Philip Bailey. And now I'm on to my next role as Nat King Cole in my self-produced show, Just One of Those Things and More, the Nat King Cole Show, under the Stewart Music Emporial, that is a non-for-profit that I'm running. Um, so before you all leave, I hope you guys come out and get a flyer, and I hope you guys come to the show. I would love to have you all there. We can go ahead and get it going. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. Jack Frost nipping at your nose. Yuletide carols being sung by a choir. Folks dressed up like Eskimos, but everybody knows a turkey and a mistletoe help to make the seasons bright. Tiny tots. With their eyes all aglow, we'll find it hard to sleep tonight. They know that Santa's on his way. They loaded lots of toys and goodies on his sleigh. And every mother's child is gonna spy to see if reindeer really know how to fly. And so I'm offering this simple phrase. 
Two kids from one to ninety-two. Although it's been said many times, many ways, Merry Christmas to you.